experience for me. Um, How long is the fellowship for? It's for three years. Three years, which yeah. you be, and this is, you have the fellowship as a, as a for your PhD, am I right? Uh, yes, I'm a, a Marie Curie fellow as well. So and three so years PhD. It's a three year PhD, and then there's a postdoc fellowship as well. Uh, the fellowship for a postdoc is founded by St. John. It has nothing to do with European Union, but um, it shows how um, the Marie Curie action has helped me to start as a researcher to found my uh, Are we, I mean, because you're at, at, at probably, I would presume, and I, I, I have not worked in academia, but it's, you was in the first year of postdoc is in many ways the most difficult stage to a certain extent. I mean, we were saying that in terms of now finding funding, now being outside to a certain extent of the examination process, it's a, uh, it's starting yourself off in an academic career. I, am I right in saying that? Some prof you just past that stage. Is it, is it, are the first years post-PhD? I would argue right now the most difficult part of people is probably finding the first faculty position, but that is based on how you perform the first or second year as a postdoc, of course. Right, okay. The, yeah, so the, so the, difficult, is it the journey they're on at the moment very different to when you come to the same phase? Yes, I think it has become more difficult. Uh, when, I, when I was at this stage uh, in the 1970s, uh, the research was more funded by institution rather than on contracts. We didn't have to, to, find, to, to, to fight so much to get, uh, to get uh, a grant or to get uh, a project going on. We had just to have the trust of the director of the lab or the director of the institution you, you belong to. And I think that was a good time because it, when you start, you have a passion for what you are doing. It's clear it, from, from what you were saying. And we are good at uh, working at creativity and we are not supposed to be entrepreneurs and starting our own business and now you, young researchers are more and more uh, asked to develop their own uh, program very early on and I think this has to be uh, controlled and it's not, it's not the optimal way uh, to, to do research for young people at least. And I think a system in which young people would uh, work under less constraints will have more uh, will be uh, given more trust in what they are doing and more time to achieve things would, would be better. But this is the things which are hard to combat at this time. Yes, I mean, you did an interview in, in Nature that I have here from uh, just after you won the Nobel Prize. And, and a number of problems that you pointed out were that uh, grants are limited to three or five years, which you yeah. say is far too short a time. I mean, you yourself spoke of the fact that five, six years later, you realized that you were now in a different field, doing a different thing, solving a different problem. Yeah. That kind of free space is needed and, 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 is, and is being reduced, is it? For, for, for a lot of projects, you need this, this free space and, and uh, uh, things were working differently uh, at, uh, in the 70s and 80s and I think uh, the, uh, the balance has gone too far in the other direction, which is to, to, to force scientists to work on short-term projects which uh, is good if you do applied research, but which is not at all adapted for, for basic science. And that's, that's what I really feel. How often do the three of you feel that breath on your neck of this, I mean, I have to get another piece of funding, I have to get another piece of funding, I have to submit in terms of short projects. Is that, does that become an issue? Um, I didn't really feel the pressure of um, getting funding because I mean, within my PhD study, I have been given all these great opportunities and um, really sufficient budget to go to conferences, to go to trainings, and to see different people. So it's, it's a lot easier to get follow-up projects mm -hmm. in this way when you have a really great network and people with new ideas coming up all the time. And also in our network, there are different sectors from the society like industry and governmental regulatory authorities. So it's different source of funding also gives you more opportunity to, to, to follow your... I think the pressure come a little, comes a little bit later when okay. you're at the level of PhD or even postdoc. Uh, you, you don't feel that, but when you, you have to start your own 
pro program after your postdoc, then you, you feel this, pr I think you yeah. feel more this pressure. I was going to say, I think for many of them, the pressure is probably hardest the first, say, two, five, six years when people only have, maybe only have one grant or something, because then you really live or die by that grant. By the time you have a slightly larger group, it's never fun to lose a grant, but if you have three other grants, you can probably survive. Um, I do think it is, I, I agree with Serge, it is a major concern that the grants are too short. Um, and I think the way we as scientists tend to survive is that you kind of, you cheat a bit, that as you promise deliverable results, you write things that you really have done already, but you just haven't submitted them yet. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think that's fundamental, it's an improductive system. Um, the, one, the one type of grant I like a lot in the European Union now is the uh, European Research Council grants, because I think mm -hmm. If you really want to change the state of the art or something, I think five years is pretty much a minimum. Um, if you're really pretending that you can change the art, state of the art or something in 12 months, something is wrong. Do you all, by the way, have a big idea that you're particularly passionate about at the moment and a time scale in which you think you can, that a, a great, you need now to work on that? Do you have a schedule in your own head of how much time you would like, free of any of the pressure, to work on the idea that you're most passionate about at the moment? Ava? Well, uh, at this point, I've, I've, reached, I've reached the end of my project. So, in, in fact, uh, uh, when I first applied to this lab, I took my own project, my own ideas, and I was very lucky that my PI, uh, Professor Kevin Brindle, allowed me to perform my own and to work on my own ideas. Um, at this stage, I, I've been fortunate and um, we, I've basically finished my project, it's, about, it's written, we're just about to submit it. Um, however, uh, in research we never get to um, a final end. There's always a new question that we want to answer. And at this point I've been, as I've told before, uh, working with this fancy technique, an amazing technique, to detect early precocial lesions of pancreatic cancer. And, um, but now there's this new drug that it seems to work on early stages of pancreatic cancer. So the next step would be why not give it a go Thank and try to see if we, metabolically speaking we can see the result of the effect of the drug. So I don't think in science, and that's the beauty in my perspective uh, of science, is there's never an end. There's always a next milestone to achieve. And there's also, there, there's never an end of the story. And that's the beauty of science in my perspective. Um, I think in terms of pressure, the thing that we were talking before, as a PhD student, I think the pressure is to, to, to get a story to tell in Alviva as a PhD student. Um, obviously that if articles come along, that's great because that will make our, uh, our next step as a postdoc or or even if, I, if, even if I go back to the clinic, it will be easier in terms of CV. But I think the, most of the pressure at this time is the limited time that we have to develop our own ideas. Right. Would that be the same for you? Is there any particular one thing that, would, that you could be freed up to do? Or, that, or is it just a case of... The, the well, I think my problem is that you, have to, you tend to have too many bright ideas. And a couple of days you realize that it wasn't so bright after all. <laughs> okay. um, I think I want to come back to the, again what Serge said, that this is very much a teamwork and one of the things I enjoy most about in science is working with people who are ideally smarter than you are um, and really sitting together, brainstorming, trying to have amazing ideas and frequently it turns out that the most important things in the long term are not necessarily the things that you work really hard on for five years but that fun little side product that leads to a strange result that nobody can explain and I think, I think Isaac Asimov once said that the most important phrase in the research is not Eureka but hmm, that's funny uh, and I think there is a lot of truth in that. It's hard to predict the future. Of course, of course. The, um, there is another comment that you made in, the, in that article uh, that one of the greatest problems is that uh, scientists spend a great deal of time filling in forms and writing reports instead of doing, uh, doing research. That it's an overly complicated system of grants and there's a constant bureaucratic element to it. Yeah, and uh, also too many evaluations. It's, not, it's clear that we need to be evaluated. We cannot work without this kind of evaluation, but the main evaluation comes from the peers, from the papers that we publish and from the recognitions and the papers received. And uh, there are sometimes too many uh, different evaluation which come one after the other which uh, force you to write reports again and again 
And as, as you just said, it's a game. When you get used to it, you repeat the same report, or you, in a proposal, you propose something that you are already doing. And I think nobody, it's okay, but it's a kind of, it's a, it's a rather funny game that we are forced to play, and we, we, which is time consuming. It would be much better if we did not have to, to work along these. It's, these lines. it's an interesting choice of language because I spoke to a well-known television-based scientist uh, who I work with occasionally uh, and he said that you could improve the productivity of all British universities by simply removing a system called REF yeah. uh, because essentially people spend 10% of their time and the exact words you were gaming the system yeah. which is just they're obliged now to justify yeah. in, a, in a language and they spend a lot of time justifying yeah. the work they do in a language that will please yeah. the system. Yeah. And I think part of this comes from the fact that uh, we are supposed, since we are spending tax uh, payers' money, that we are supposed to, to deliver things and we are supposed to show them that we, the money is well spent. Uh, but I, I think uh, this, is all, this also comes from the fact that science has some problems with society. There is a lot of people who, who are afraid of science, who, who don't trust science, or who think that science has uh, give, uh, has bad uh, effects or bad results and uh, I think we have to educate uh, more uh, the general public so that he understand the value of science as such and maybe then uh, this, this kind of uh, uh, lack of confidence in science would decrease and, and this need for constant evaluation and constant uh, 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 check uh, that we are doing what we are supposed to do would, would decrease this kind of pressure. But uh, may maybe, it's, maybe it's, uh, it's just a hope which will not come to By the way, just pick a, a cheery, more inspiring uh, end of it. Was there one particular idea that, that kept you, one particular problem that you always, uh, even that you heard of early in your career and said, I, w I want to solve this? This may apply to all of you, yes. but there was one particular thing. I, I think. From the beginning, I had an idea. I, I really had the dream, which was to be able to to observe single particles. You know, uh, uh, people have been knowing for many, many years that single particles did exist. In an, in an accelerator, you see the traces of particles, but this is completely different from what we are doing. What we do now in the lab is that we are observing single particles without destroying them, so that we are able to observe them and to react on them and to manipulate them, so to speak, in vivo, if you want to take a biological image. And whereas before that, we were doing that in kind of post-mortem analysis of the, the debris that the particle had left. So from the beginning, from the time I, I, I uh, studied for my PhD, uh, my dream was to be able to isolate single atoms and particles, and this was a part of a big adventure. I am not by far the only one working in this field. Um, hundreds of teams in the world which have succeeded in doing that. We, we were talking before about the fact that the research is a teamwork. It's a teamwork with the people working around you, but it's also a teamwork worldwide. We are working with a com community of people who, do this, who have the same dreams and the same goals all over the world, and the, really one of the big uh, advantages of, the, of this uh, uh, work, and I don't, I don't call it a work of doing research, is that you are in, in constant touch with all these people who have different backgrounds but the same dreams and the same uh, working in, in, in using the same concepts and along the same lines and this is very rewarding. To be able to understand what others are doing is a very important part of all this. So you, you, you sought this one goal, this incredible yeah. goal, and it was a driving force throughout. Yes. How much of your time were you on the wrong track or doing the wrong thing or making a not quite perfect uh, mirror? Or? Very often, you are, very often, of course, you, are, you realize that things that you are trying do not work. And, and this is a problem because we are responsible not only for what we are doing, but we are responsible for training students. So when you have a student on a project and you are on the wrong track for three years, the student has a problem for his PhD. So we always, it's, it's a very delicate and very, you are always on the edge. You have to find out what is your goal, long-term goal, and also to have solutions, short-term solutions uh, to give projects to students which will give them their PhD even if they don't get to the final, to the final result. So, but 
we, there are some drawbacks. We, we had some very, some ideas for the, our cavities which did not work and it took us, took us a couple of years, three or four years to find that it was not the right way. And sometimes you have accidents in the lab. You, a piece of equipment blows up and it takes one or two years to fix it. And so we have, uh, you have to have a lot of uh, patience and you have to be confident that the, the, the end, uh, the, the goal that you want to reach is worthwhile, all these efforts. So the wrong idea took three or four years to realize it was the wrong idea? They are not really wrong ideas. They are, I, uh, of hey, course, don't of course, backtrack now. Uh, yeah, yeah, no. I mean, a, a, a wrong idea, you find very quickly that it's wrong. It might be not, not that good idea, with, and, uh, and you can do something with it, but it does not bring you to the final, uh, to the final solution. As you three, on, on the start of this process, do you find that inspiring or frightening or do you feel there's a degree of a gamble yeah. in terms of... I wouldn't of have it any other way. That's, that's the beauty yeah. of science. That's finding, fighting not just with the project, but you're fighting with yourself, your ideas and everything. That's the whole reason I'm doing science. And we, we spoke about evaluations before and as much as I hate these formal evaluations, the research assessment exercises, being evaluated by your peers is part of it. That Nobody likes getting bad reviews, and the only thing that's worse than that is when the reviewers are quite right, that it was a bad idea. And this, of course, what brings science forward, that if I have a bad idea, somebody else is sooner or later going to point that out, that you can do this in a much smarter way. Yeah, yeah on the other hand, probably, um, I think these, um, the skill of explaining very complicated ideas to normal audience in simplified language is actually a good test. Um, for example, because I work with models and uh, a lot of the time um, people don't believe in models because they think it's black box. Um, they don't know what is happening uh, inside, what mechanisms you're using. So it's, it's extremely important for us as modelers to explain and communicate your model to people without modeling background. Uh, what you're doing and to give them more confidence in your model. So um, at the same level, maybe to explain your research ideas to um, the reviewers from different background is, is a similar thing that if you, if you manage to explain it and um, if people manage to, to understand you, that's a good thing rather than I know, listen, I've tried to explain scientific ideas to models a couple of times at parties uh, and they're notoriously difficult to get it over. Uh, so the, uh, again, is, is it inspiring to you? The f particularly interesting for you because you obviously have this other career that you have stepped away from. The, uh, by the way, is it full time? Are you going to go back? Uh, well, at the moment I'm a full-time uh, full PhD student, yes, and I'll be coming back as a full-time trainee. Yeah, uh, but, as, but are you, uh, do, is there a sense which you're at a crossroads that you feel that you should maybe stay and carry on doing more research or? Um, if I could choose my path, I would keep on doing research, but I understand that uh, it is also important for me and I've invested already two years and a half on my training. I think it's, it's worth the, the, um, the effort to finish radiology and keep on doing research. I think at the end of the day, my aim is to, is to keep on doing research and filling the, the loop of translational research from the, bed to the, uh, from the bench to the bedside and from the bedside to the bench. And that's what I am to be uh, in the future, personally. Okay. Uh, we're going to throw some questions out to the floor if anyone has any questions that they want to ask. While there was, oh, just there. Fantastic. The first question is there. While we're getting that microphone to you, by the way, was there any particular moment in all of you that you realized you really wanted to be a scientist, you really wanted to... Was there a, p a teacher? Was there an idea? Was there a thing you saw once? That In my case, there was. When I came to Brussels to, to do the MRI rotation, uh, when I went back to Portugal, I knew exactly what I wanted. I knew that I wanted to do research. Was not for the degree itself, not the PhD. That was not my, my motivation, but was doing research. It wasn't a result or an idea. I mean, this even going back to when you were teenagers, when you were in school, or was there any particular thing that... Yeah. When I was at school, in high school, I knew that I wanted to do science. And uh, it, we talked about the Apollo generation in the previous session. And my time was the time when the first satellites were launched, the first rockets to the moon. And the fact that uh, with simple math, it was possible to compute the velocities and the trajectories of these 
objects were, was fascinating to me, the fact that nature obeyed to mathematical laws and this was a tr the trigger for going into, into science. I did not think I could be just an abstract mathematician, uh, but applying math to do science was fascinating me. Amazing school teachers. Sorry? Amazing school teachers. Really? A particularly good teacher? Was a particularly good thing that they ever, do you remember a moment or? So I think I, I started school in 1979, but they probably followed some scheme that was designed in 1912 or something, uh, which worked quite well. Um, <laughs> Um, now they completely disregarded everything I think they should teach us. Uh, so in Sweden in 1979 it was very liberal and we were not supposed to emphasize mathematics and physics, but they didn't care. They taught us mathematics and physics mm -hmm. anyway. Um, and then it's gone up uh, back and forth that science is also, it's not just a pure pleasure. It's hard sometimes and everything, but finding these role models that eventually you realize that yes, it's hard, but you can still enjoy it while it's hard. And being hard is part of the enjoyment, I think. Yes. Chun, was there a particular one? Yeah, I have far, always had an interest in environment and animals, but I wasn't 100% sure that I want to do science. Um, not until I was doing my master's study in Uppsala University and um, doing the project, uh, thesis project, I was working with a population of Siber uh, Siberian jays in northern Sweden. And I found out it's really cool with mathematical models that you can describe and predict the syst complicated system in a very uh, logical way. So I thought, oh, science is really charming and cool to do. So <laughs> that kind there's of There's your takeaway. Uh, it's charming and cool to do. That's the excellent the message. Uh, there was a question. It was behind me. Yes, yeah. Um, hello, I'm uh, Dolores Ramirez from Madrid. And rather than a question, it's a reflection that I'd like to share with you. Because um, I really admire what you do as scientists, as researchers, uh, um, caring about the earth, uh, the economy, about uh, saving people, finding a cure for disease, cancer. And, uh, but what about, I'm really missing social science. Uh, what about um, education that has been mentioned all day long? But what about research in education? Is it, I feel uh, that is a kind of uh, second ranked uh, science and perhaps we do not um, conduct research on atoms or photons or bacteria, but do we, we do conduct research on learners, for example, on people, on teenagers, on children, and I think they are important as well. So science and research, obviously, and I do admire all of you and, and, uh, and sort of experimental uh, science, but it's just my reflection. What about social science? Thank you. Because it is a huge part of an academic career is, is teaching. Yes. No, I, I agree uh, that social science and humanities are not even more than social science. Humanities are also very important because all all the, the quest of knowledge is is one. You cannot have creativity in one field if you are not free to think and if you are not exposed to ideas which come from other fields. And I belong to an institution which has known that for centuries. The Collège de France in, in, in Paris is an institution in which you have professors working in hard science, uh, physics, biology, chemistry, uh, geoscience, but also in humanities, archaeology, philosophy, social sciences, anthropology, and we all interact with each other and we try to develop projects which are the boundaries between, between these fields. So I agree that social science and education is very, is very important and uh, that programs should be devoted to this, to, to this uh, uh, part of knowledge. In, the, in France, the CNRS is, is, a, is a research institution uh, which has researchers in hard sciences but also in sociology, in political sciences, in all these fields. Just turns out that in, on this panel we don't have anybody in this yes. field. That it, this but, is I, but I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, so just last week, they, the Swedish Innovation Agency published a report where they had Arthur Bienenstock, who's a retired professor at Stanford, compare Stanford and Berkeley with some of the big Swedish universities. And I think the original idea was that they want to know how can Swedish universities become as successful. And again, this being the Innovation Agency, I think their idea was to focus more on innovation. 
but surprisingly, the outcome of this report, which was not written by Swedes but by Americans, was that they were extremely surprised by the domination of natural science, external grants, and commercialization at our universities. It's frequently up to 75-80%, while at both Stanford and Berkeley, more than 50% of the income is related to undergraduate education. And they really emphasized this role that, of course, it's not that innovation based on science is unimportant, but the university's big role in society is really educating a new generation of world leaders and people that go out. And they had this number that over the last 20 years or something, there had been 1,000 companies started by Stanford faculty. That's pretty nice, but there had been 39,950 companies started by Stanford students. And that's a far more important fact. And many of them are not in sciences. They are in, uh, sorry, not in natural sciences. They're in social and humanistic sciences. Yeah. No, I, I think this is related to the structure of the American system, which gives so much emphasis on the undergraduate studies, yes. which is much less emphasized in Europe. Now, in the same uh, uh, discussion, I think it is important to uh, uh, talk to discuss what's going on in Southeast Asia. There are a lot of countries like Singapore, China, Korea, which are developing science very strongly, but they put a lot of emphasis on, on hard science, on technology, and I think that they would be really successful if they develop also humanities at the same time, because you need to, to be in a context where all uh, these ideas can fertilize each other, and I think it's especially the case in China. China is, is devoting a lot of efforts to spend money on technology, but as long as they won't be free and they won't develop a free spirit in the, in the university system, I doubt that they will be able to get the result that they, that they hope to, to get, in, even in terms of hard science. You cannot cut science from uh, a broader perspective on the world, and I think this is a big asset we have in Europe in which science has been developing for many, many centuries in parallel with philosophy, with sociology, and with all the other branches of knowledge which are important. Uh, are there any more questions from the audience? Oh, yeah. This, uh, what has just been said, leads me to uh, my question. I wanted to know if you think, as young researcher, that uh, Europe is the finest place for you to work in a long-term perspective, or do you intend to uh, go maybe to the United States or Canada or China to work? So we know you're returning to, to medical uh, to work. To, uh, the, uh, this may not apply to you then directly. But do you think Europe, Europe specifically you're saying, is, this, is it the right environment here for what you're doing? Or would you? I think Europe is a great place to work, especially for my area. It's the, um, the most development um, place of this topic and with the, the most people in this area to cooperate with. So currently I'm completely happy with where I am. So I'm happy with Europe in general, but there are lots of places in the world I could imagine living. North Korea wouldn't be at the top of my list, and I could probably skip Syria too, but apart from that, almost, I think one of the amazing things in science is that it's not really a competition between countries, it's a community working together, and after a while you tend to have so many friends in different parts of the world that I could probably imagine living, or rather, I hope that I'm not going to be active in just in Europe the rest of my career. But right now, with the historically I would have said that the US universities have had a very large advantage with their structure and combination of undergraduate research, undergraduate training and research. Uh, today, with the way the economy looks in the US, I would probably recommend a postdoc to go to Europe instead. Well, in my personal view, I think Europe offers pretty much the same as uh, what the United States is offering at this moment. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to, personally, I wouldn't go to the United States and everything I need and everything I would like to do, I think Europe is providing. In fact, I think the European Union has, has, has done a pioneer work with uh, promoting and funding new projects uh, at either at an early stage or even at the consolidation state of researchers. So I'm very pleased to work in Europe and I would like to keep on working in Europe. How do you think the systems compare between Europe and America in particular? The systems are, are different. We already discussed part of the difference. I, I I've spent many years teaching and, and doing research in the United States and I think it was a very rewarding experience to be uh, exposed to different ways of education and to different ways of doing research. 
but of course, in the end, I, I came back to Europe, so it, it gives some indication about <laughs> what uh, I thought. I think, uh, at least in the kind of research that I am doing, Europe is at the edge of what can be done, and uh, it does not mean that you don't have a, a very high uh, quality of research in the United States. The system, the system is a little bit different. Uh, the competition is a little bit more aggressive in the United States. And, uh, uh, but uh, this difference tends to, to be blurred. It, it was a case in 20 or 30 years ago that research was working under kind of different rules across the Atlantic, but now we are under the global economy uh, uh, market and, and uh, things tend to be more uh, closely related, uh, but I agree with what has been said that you, you can you can be comfortable doing doing research in Europe and uh, and the economical problems that we feel in Europe are felt also in the United States uh, now. So I don't know what the future will. Be. Fine. So you're not losing students, for example, the brighter students that you see coming through, you're not losing necessarily uh, to America. We we don't lose students. We we may start losing some people after uh, like postdoc who go to the United States and don't come back. Mm. This may happen and we have to, to worry about that and to make sure that we can offer opportunities to young, bright young people to start their own research in, in Europe and this is part of what I said before. We have to give them uh, ways to work under this trust, time and trust uh, attitude that, uh, that might be an advantage of the United States if we are able to build these kind of, uh, of uh, conditions in Europe. And let's name a second competitive place for them. The, uh, are you losing students who leave for jobs in private industry? Uh, yeah, this happens too. We, we, for, it, for some time we are losing students who get into the financial uh, mm. business, uh, traders and things like that. Now, fortunately, this has decreased a little bit but we may lose students, and, but it, it depends on the countries. I think this is a problem, special problem in France. The, this, uh, um, we, we lose students who go in, in the private sector, which is not losing them because after all, if they get a good job, it's okay. Uh, the opposite problem in France is that the doctorate, the PhD, is not well recognized by the private industries. It's difficult for a postdoc, for, for a doctor, to get hired into private uh, industry in France, it is easier in countries like Germany. And uh, I know that now in France, people, uh, the, uh, the government is trying to, to make this easier, the, the, the crossing the barrier between uh, ac the academic careers and the industry careers, and I think this is good. We, do, we don't have to keep people who don't, do not want to do research. It's clear that research is a very good training because it gives it makes you understand where the problems are. It's a kind of uh, problem solving mm. technique which can be applied to other fields of activities. And in this respect, it's good to have a research training if you go and work uh, in other branch of activities. Okay, are you losing students at last point or are you tempted yourself to? No, I would second thing that I don't consider losing them. So it happened roughly a year ago, I lost one of the uh, Dutch people that actually recruited back from the US to a uh, stockbroker company in Oxford and he probably makes three times what I'm doing now and that's not losing. That somebody has spent 20 years doing science and suddenly somebody in industry is willing to pay a shitload of money for that. That's great. I think that's really, that's putting value in what we're doing and that's not losing. Of course, I, I think it's a waste of his time just working with stocks, but that's <laughs> different. <laughs> you're, not tempted, you're not tempted yourself then to take the bioinformatics and set up your own company? We've done that rather, but my I enjoyed the process. I think it's fun to watch the commercialization from outside, but I'm not enough interested in making in the making money part of it. Uh, and I've had certainly have had lots of good students and postdocs who are much better at that part. I enjoy seeing it, but it's simply there are some, there are so many people out there in the world that are far better at that than I am. While I'm reasonably good at the science. Okay, Chun, equally, you're not going to set up a herbicide company and disappear mm -hmm. from academia. I probably can give an interesting example um, of my own experience because um, in my area of ecological modeling for risk assessment of pesticide or chemicals, um, we have a group of people in the CREAM project and once we were all in a conference in America and we had a session 
on ecological modeling. It's probably on Wednesday afternoon or something. And um, two of my friends, they were taking a short course before the conference um, about ecological modeling. And they were very interested to know how the development of uh, this area was in America. So they were asking this um, course organizer how people are applying this kind of models. And this um, course organizers, obviously, th he didn't know where they come from. And he was saying that, actually, they have a session on Wednesday afternoon. Why don't you go and have a look? So it's kind of directed by... Uh,